Great to see you today. Oh, well, it's always good to be seen, too. Thank you, choir. I know y'all can always back me up. You know, I think whenever the church gathers uh, for worship, that makes it a great day. And, and sometimes we forget uh, just why we're here. So I want you to remind one another of who you are and why you're here. So uh, turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. And then turn to your other neighbor and say, and God has a plan for your life. And that plan is that you might know him through his son, Jesus Christ, and come to accept the love and the forgiveness that he has to extend all. Our scripture lesson for today comes from John's gospel. I'll be reading from the first chapter. And I invite you to bow your heads as we pray for illumination. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, open our ears to the truth of your word, that the testimony of Christ may be strengthened among us, and that the eyes of our hearts may be opened to see the way of salvation. For this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the Savior of the world. Amen. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, He comes after me, is really greater than me because he existed before me. Even I didn't recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be made known to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove, and it rested on him. Even I didn't recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit coming down and resting is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this one is God's Son. <clears throat> the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? And they said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And he replied, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The other day I was in a department store. Letitia was in the women's shoes department. And most of the men know that's about a half a day affair. <laughs> and so I just told her, I'm going to go over to the men's department and I'm just going to look around. So, you know, I, I'm always looking uh, for not really what I'm, I don't know what it is, but I figure that when I see it, I'll know it. So I'm just kind of, mo. Anyway, I'm just kind of mulling around, 
when the salesperson comes up and she asks, may I help you? And I say, no, I'm, you know, I'm good. I'm just kind of killing time. My wife's out shoe shopping. And she says, well, you know, if you need anything, I'll be right over there and I'll help you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, I'd really come to look at shirts and as it happened, uh, she was stationed in the shirt department. And uh, not wanting to appear too eager, I kind of played it cool, you know, I'm looking at things, and kind of feel through the ties, and then I walk over to the shirts, and she says to me again, can I help show you something? No, no, I'm, I'm just looking. Which really wasn't true, because I knew what it was that I wanted, and I thought that I could find it myself. So, what I encounter is these mountains of shirts that are available. And even though I knew uh, the size and the style and the color of shirts, I was having difficulty finding them. Well, she's like a master fisherman. She's given me just enough line for me to run where it is I want to go, and then she comes to reel me in to make the sale. And she says, can I help you find something? What are you looking for? And I tell her, and she takes me right where it was I needed to be. And the question I have for you today is, what are you looking for? What compelled you to get up today on your day off to get dressed, make sure your family is ready, drive some distance to the church to do something that two-thirds of your neighbors didn't even think about doing? It never even crossed their radar to go to church today. What makes you do that? What is it that you're looking for? Now, there may be some of you who you came under protest today. Uh, your mother or grandmother or your girlfriend or somebody had invited you. No, they insisted that you go with them to church, and uh, you're pretty much not looking for anything. You may be looking to be entertained, but you're probably thinking, I'm going to be bored, and you probably will. Now, some of you may be looking for a church home. Uh, you may say, well, we're just kind of shopping around. And we'll know the church that we want to be in when we see it, but we just don't know what it is right now, and, and that's okay. I hope that maybe uh, you will find a church home here, or we will help you find a church home that meets your needs uh, and your wants. But what I've found is most people don't really know what it is that they want. They're just searching. And there may be some of you today, you're new to the community and you're looking for a place of belonging. You want to be a part of a community because you need friends. You need people who will care about you and pray for you, you're looking for a place of belonging. And for a lot of us, we come here today as members and friends of this congregation because we're looking for Jesus. We come to church hoping that God may actually show up. Wouldn't that be amazing? What if God actually showed up and began changing people's lives so that they are made whole again. That would grab our attention. We don't know if God is going to show up for us or not, but we go just in case. God will make himself known here. What are you looking for? 
Will you know it when you see it? When John came on to the scene in Israel's history, he takes the role of an Old Testament prophet. He, he wears uh, strange clothing, uh, and he preaches uh, basically a fire and brimstone message. Uh, God is angry at you. You're all going to hell unless you repent, and as a sign of your repentance, of getting right with God, you should be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And strangely enough, people came out. They sought to hear the message that John was preaching. It would never work today, would it? But the people came out. They were, they were looking for something, and what they were looking for was the Messiah of Israel. Uh, we call it uh, a messianic hope. They were anticipating that God was about to intervene in their history and they wanted to be ready. And they were looking for the Messiah. But they didn't know where he would appear. So John the Baptist comes onto the scene and even though John's gospel doesn't mention uh, Jesus' baptism particularly, John tells from the first person point of view, I did not even know him, but God sent me to baptize in order that the Messiah might be revealed to Israel. And the one upon whom the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and rested. I'm here to declare to you that he is God's Son. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John is pointing to where people could see God. The next day, uh, he and two of his disciples, two students of John, are standing there, and they see Jesus walking toward them, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And his two disciples turn away from John, and they begin following Jesus. And Jesus, aware that they're behind him, he turns and says, What are you looking for? And they said, Lord, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. Now there are a couple of different ways that we could take that message. In John's gospel, he is usually talking on two different levels. He's talking at a level in which the disciples tend to take what he's saying literally. But most of the time, what Jesus is really talking about is up here. And a good example of that is with Nicodemus. You remember the story that this priest named Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he says, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, because no one else could do the works that you're doing unless they were sent by God. And Jesus says sort of this cryptic thing to him, he says, unless you are born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you see, Nicodemus misunderstands. He's looking at the literal level, and he says, how is it possible for me, an old man, to crawl back up into my mother's womb and be born again? But that's not what Jesus was talking about. He was not talking about being born of the flesh, but being born of the Spirit. What if when these disciples of John went in search of Jesus to follow him, and Jesus asked them, you know, that question, what are you looking for? And he offers an invitation, come and see, that maybe the scene is different than what we think. You see, you can see on one level, like uh, 
where are you staying? Well, I'm staying at the Holy Day Inn here on the sea, uh, the Dead Sea. And that would be one way of saying, where are you staying? Well, come see, this is where I am. This is where I'm living right now. But instead, what if Jesus is inviting them to come and see with eyes of faith who he really is? What did you come looking for today? You know, there may be some of you that come today because uh, you've made a total mess of your life. You have burned bridges and broken relationships. You've been part of some uh, addictive or risky behavior. You have alienated everyone around you and you're feeling guilty and alone and you think that there is no one on your side. What are you looking for? Peace? Redemption? Forgiveness? Salvation? Transformation? What are you looking for? You see, I believe those two disciples of John were looking for the messianic hope, and they believed it was Jesus. And Jesus invites them to come and see, and when they saw, they understood. And the next thing that Andrew does is he goes and finds his brother, Simon Peter. Remember that? You see, in each one of these instances, there is a witness there is someone who is pointing the way. First, it was John the Baptist. He said, if you want to find God, look over there. I'll take you right to him. And then when Andrew uh, discovered the real identity of Jesus, what does he do? He goes and finds his brother, and he says, we have found the Christ, the Messiah. And he brings his brother Simon to Jesus. Simon doesn't want quite understand yet. But Jesus says, Simon, son of John, from henceforth you will be called Peter. And in the back of our minds we should hear from Matthew's gospel where Jesus goes on to explain for you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Now, the disciples never really get who Jesus is. Uh, they are slow learners. That should tell us something as well. Uh, we tend to be slow learners. But it's not until after the resurrection that Jesus reveals himself to them for who he really is. And Peter, wanting Jesus to be some other Messiah, ends up denying him three times, deserting him, and hides in fear. It is only the women disciples who remain. It is no wonder that when Jesus is raised, the first person that he would reveal himself to is Mary Magdalene, one of the women who stood at the foot of the cross, who witnessed his death. She'd come to the tomb that early Sunday morning to anoint the body of Jesus. But instead, when she got there, she found an empty tomb. And she ran back to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. And Peter runs to the tomb, and he looks inside, and all he saw was the grave clothes neatly folded and stacked together. But Jesus, he did not see. 
It was only a day or so later that Jesus appears to all the disciples. He says, look at my hand, see the print of the nails, look at my feet and my side. I am the crucified one. I died, but behold, I am alive. And, it, and John says, and they believed, but some doubted, some doubted. Now, when Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit in John's gospel, he breathes upon them, and he seems to exit history at that point, earth itself. But he, on occasions, appears among the disciples. Peter and his friends have gone back to their families, to their jobs. They're fishing in the lake when Jesus uh, suddenly is on the seashore, but they don't recognize him. Isn't that an interesting thing? They've seen the resurrected Christ, but now they don't recognize him. He calls them children. How's the fishing going? They said, not too good. We fished all night long. We haven't caught anything. And he says, throw your nets on the other side. And they caught a large catch of fish, so large that their boats began to sink. And John says, it's the Lord. Peter jumps in the water. He swims to the shore. And what's interesting in this is this little notation in which the disciples were not really sure whether it was Jesus, but they were too afraid to ask. And then Jesus centers, uh, uh, singles out Peter, and he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? You notice he doesn't use his name Peter. Do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. A second time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon said, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, tend my lambs. And then Jesus a third time says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than all of these? And by this time, Simon is driven by grief. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. You see, the, the three times that Jesus deny, or that Peter denied Jesus, are met by these three times that Jesus asked him, do you love me? And what Peter experiences in that moment is a moment of grace, forgiveness, assurance. Friends, there are people in your lives right now who are looking for something. They probably don't even know what it is. And they may be coming to a church because they're hoping whatever that emptiness in their life can be filled here. And guess what? You're their guide. You're their salesperson, if you want to put it in that language. You're the one who's going to say, what are you looking for? I don't know. Well, why don't you come over here and maybe I can help show you. And that's the task that Jesus has set before us. That we are willing to be guides to share the way of life that we have come to know and that is possible for them as well. What are you looking for, church? Come and see. Maybe you'll just find Jesus.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.